Well, hi, Christina. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Okay, let's start with you sharing more about your background and your work. Sure. So I am currently a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, where I head up the first year entrepreneurship course, and I run Startup Boot Camp for all of our MBA entrepreneurs. Um, and then my most recent book, uh, The Portfolio Life, just came out. This is my second book. So I've got that kind of going in tandem. And then on the side, I'm an angel investor. I invest in startups and in Broadway commercial theater productions, um, which is sort of my my way of staying in the world, both uh, of entrepreneurship and also of the arts. Because before I became a professor, I was a serial entrepreneur and a working artist. So it's uh, it's nice to be able to keep those things in my portfolio right now. I was going to ask you, what were you doing? Like, what led you to become a Harvard <laughs> professor? So that makes a lot more sense. You you had been there and done that, and now they're asking exactly. you to do that. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, they don't normally just ask anybody to do that. Um, <laughs> okay, so you have this amazing book called Portfolio Life, but I want to talk about what is a portfolio career? Sure. So a portfolio career um, is when you have more than one source of income, right? As you think about this the strands of how you think about your work. Now that could be simultaneously, right? You might have more than one uh, revenue source right now, maybe a day job with a side hustle, maybe some consulting work or uh, a small business, but it also could be a way of thinking about your career um, consecutively, but just in, in much more of like a zigzag way, right? Like you could make your living I don't know, as a teacher and then make a big pivot and then suddenly make your living as a writer. And, and I would consider that a portfolio career as well, because you can't just go from one to the other. You don't just show up one day and say like, I would like to do this now. In reality, while you're doing the first thing, you probably had that writing or whatever that thing is as a hobby or as a, a something you were really pursuing seriously. And then one day decided to flip the switch and make that your career. So they've always coexisted. You might just be changing which activity you monetize and which you don't. Yeah. And I like the name portfolio career. I, I feel like it's a much more positive spin on a career changer, making the career pivot, career transition. Mm -hmm. Some of those are negative, but they always feel like you're taking a step back or you have mm -hmm. to take a step back to go forward. Mm -hmm. Whereas like portfolio Obviously, you're you're taking some cues from finance, but mm -hmm. before we get into that and the diversifying piece of it, what are the three tenets for a portfolio career? Yeah, so it starts with you are more than any one job, right? I think so many people, especially the further you get into your career, you start really identifying yes. with your job and not just like your industry or your function, but your specific job. And so step one of all of this is to remember I am more than just how I'm monetizing my time and talents today. Number two, it's about understanding that diversification is kind of the only way to future-proof, right? It's the best way to navigate change and mitigate uncertainty. And change is the new normal, right? It's, it's the world we live in now. And so diversification is going to be what helps keep you uh, afloat. And then part three is simply understanding that you're going to go through seasons in your life. You're going to go through chapters. And as you hit a chapter change, your needs will change, your priorities will change. And it is absolutely essential that you rebalance your portfolio for that season of life. It's not being flaky. It's not losing your ambition. It's simply a rebalancing of the allocation of your time and talents. Yeah. I like the diversification analogy here because, you know, it's similar to with your money and your investments. You don't buy, you don't put all of your money into one mm -hmm. individual stock, right? You, the goal is to diversify. And I think when you think about that for your career, it's like putting all of your energy into one job title or one skill set. Um, mm -hmm. although on the flip side, there are plenty of people who might be listening to this who are saying, look, I've heard that the being the quote, the Jane of all trades is also not mm -hmm. very helpful. It's not great to be a generalist. So what do you, what advice would you say to someone who maybe pushes back against this a little bit? Yeah, I, I got that pushback from a colleague, uh, in, in the finance department, believe it or not. Um, he's like, I get it, but also there's, there's, there's something about specialization. I was like, no, I, I hear you. 
I'm not suggesting that folks should be flaky where you try something and then two years later, you try something else. And then two years later, you try something else. It's more of the idea that because you are more than one thing, instead of thinking of like, oh, uh, it's specialized versus not. It's like, no, it's about, do I cut off every other part of myself? Do I put it away and, and, you know, shove it in a corner in order to be serious and professional? Or do I let those parts of me still breathe and express themselves? So this could look like maybe, maybe I had this example at an event last night where it's an econ major, got his MBA, worked in finance, and that's all he's ever done. And I was like, sure, professionally, but you nerd out about something right? There's like a corner of the internet, a Reddit thread or a TikTok, you know, corner or someplace where you go and you know, every character or every stat or every storyline, there's this other interest, right? He's like, yes. I was like, okay, so what else is there? There are all these other things. And maybe that's a silly idea that like your obsession with the Marvel universe has anything to do with your career in finance. But I promise when you start letting some of this breathe, you'll realize like, oh no, I love the Marvel universe because I've always loved storytelling. I've always loved drawing and graphic design and, and, you know, fiction. And there's this whole creative side of me that I only really thought about in terms of play, but actually could be really relevant as I think through what comes next after this finance career maybe reaches reaches what I came to do, right? And so mm-hmm. it's it's allowing yourself to be multifaceted rather than saying, oh, you're a Jane of all trades. Like, it's not that. So part of it's also the way you spell it or the how you spin it or talk about it to other people, right? Like I'm I not mean- a generalist. I'm, <laughs> I have a huge interest in Marvel, something like that, right? Exactly. I mean, this is why there's a whole chapter in the book about how to tell your story, because you're right. I mean, on the one hand, you say it's how you spin it, but on the other hand, it's simply how are you connecting right. the dots? Yeah. And not just for other people, for yourself. I think yeah. sometimes this this judgment of like, I'm a flake or I'm a dilettante that starts as an internal judgment as you don't understand why you have these different things you like to do. And so you like, you know, you you almost like self-flagellate over the fact that it doesn't make any sense instead of saying like, no, I, I love math and I love theater. That doesn't have to be inconsistent or flaky. So let's find how they intersect or how, both of those can be true about me. And once I figure out how to talk to myself about it, it's not that hard to tell everyone else. Yeah, I remember having sort of this aha moment. So when I graduated college, it was all about find your passion, find your passion. What are you passionate about? You know, when you were lost and you asked for advice, they'd say, well, what are you passionate about? And the first time I heard someone say, well, I'm a multi-passionate, I was like, oh my gosh, I am too. But like, <laughs> no one, no one gave me that language, you know? Yeah, You're like, I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know you were allowed to have more than one. Um, and it, it's, it, it, to your point, it's very interesting, but sometimes finding the the language to describe mm-hmm. it can feel a, a little bit stressful. And also I interviewed someone the other day and she had um, an interesting introduction. She had done lots of different stuff. And then she, um, she concluded the whole introduction by saying like, the common thread between all of those things is this. And it was one exactly. sentence. And I, again, like sometimes I feel like advice is is like everything you're saying is right. But part of the advice, the tangible piece of this is like, okay, what's the language on how we can, how we can actually talk about that. And I think that's yeah. fantastic. No, I mean, this is literally why I came up with the introduction. I'm Christina and I'm a human Venn diagram. And I've built my career at the intersection of business, technology, and the arts. Yes. And you're like, oh, it makes sense that you're a business professor in tech startups and you still invest in Broadway. Like, okay, all makes sense now. Well, and it's also nice because there's a visual to that, right? Like people know Mm -hmm. what a Venn diagram looks like. So they're already expecting like the combination piece of it, which is like why they're expecting three things to come out. Mm -hmm. Um, how does someone create their own Venn diagram? You know, where do they start? Um, I mean, you have a really interesting story. Maybe we can start with kind of like the the three questions you're supposed to start with that you you talk about in your book. Yeah, I mean, I, this is there's a combination of both like self reflection as you think through like what do I do, what do I love to do, both now and kind of 
in previous versions of myself? Where have I nerded out, right? There's all of this where you can kind of mine your own uh, experiences and excavate some things. But then there's also the external feedback, which I find actually really helpful too. Um, I'm, a, I'm certainly a very self-reflective person and yet was surprised when I did this exercise. And I went out to people in my network and I asked them these three questions to hear back some of these answers over and over again. I was like, oh, is that, I I never would have thought that about me. So these three questions are, when have you seen me happiest? Which is a really interesting question because you start realizing, especially if you're someone who can do a lot of things, right? You're often the person who's like, oh, she can handle it, give it to her. And the problem there is like, some of those things you probably love doing and you, you know, you're good at it, it's easy. And then some of these things actually probably bring a lot of friction to your day, but you're good at it. And so you get asked to do it. And so if you're only thinking about, well, what are the things I do? You might fail to distinguish between the things that bring you joy, that you're really happy doing and the things that you hate, but you're good at it. And so you keep doing it. So number one, when have you seen me happiest? Number two, what do you come to me for? Like, what is that spark in your head where you say, you know, I should see what Christina has to think about this because that will help really uh, identify what's that thing that like everyone else almost uses as like a a personal brand or a a placeholder for the, the types of problems Christina can solve, right? And then number three, where do I stand out against my peers? And this sometimes can help you identify superpowers where you're like, oh, is that not easy for everybody? And they're like, no, it's, it really is hard for most people except you. Right. And you're like, oh, that that's a thing I do. So you get this feedback and the point of these three questions, you don't take any specific person's reactions to you as like the gospel truth, but you talk to enough folks in your life across kind of a, a, a cross section of people who know you and love you, and you start to spot trends. And those trends can be part of the strands of what you bring into your Venn diagram. And the thing about your Venn diagram, you know, my shorthand is about industries, but it can be a lot of different things. It could be functions. You could say storytelling is part of your Venn diagram. Um, It could be of, you know, how you show up for people, coaching uh, or mentoring is part of your Venn diagram. So you can think about, all these different worlds that you inhabit. And then what the fun of the Venn diagram uh, uh, analogy, as you pointed out, is where do they intersect? Where do they overlap? And often, as you force yourself to think through those intersections, that's when you start to uncover big opportunities you might not have been going after yet. Yeah. So with the Venn diagram, you basically have, you know, circle on the left, circle on the right. The left is you answering those questions for yourself. The right is the responses you get from people. And then the middle is where those two things overlap. No, I I really think of the Venn diagram as as who you are, right? Each circle is sort of a world you inhabit. The, The answers that you get from folks and the input that you have don't think about those in terms of your your Venn, like stick those on sticky notes and then start to cluster by theme. And as you start having these themes, you can draw a little circle around the theme and that becomes one of your circles. Um, And so as you, you know, I have three in my shorthand. In reality, I probably have five or six in what I would consider my Venn diagram. You can have as many as suits you, but really think through, you know, what are the big you know, meaty chunks of the world that I care about, that I bring some point of view to, and that I really want to keep playing in. Yeah, I love the sticky note idea too. Because again, I'm a very tangible learner. I I really need to like visualize and see it. And so I think (laughs) being able to have the sticky notes where you can kind of move things around too, I think it literally helps you see, okay, there's five sticky notes over in this category, or this is the theme, project management. I, people keep saying mm-hmm. how organized I am. Okay, follow the breadcrumbs of organization could lead to what type of careers are good for people who love organizing. Th- those exactly. are essentially the breadcrumbs you you go from using this as a Venn diagram to actually getting it, figuring out your next career move. Or That's or exactly even, right. Yeah, lateral moves within your own company, that kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. 
I love that. And you have a really interesting story about you had a startup that failed and you basically mm-hmm. had to do this, right? Did I, did I, I <laughs> yeah, like, you are, you are exactly right. No, my, my, my career has been all sorts of zigs and zags, but one of the big kind of inflection points uh, for me was my first startup that I, I built with a friend right after I graduated from business school. Um, it was this exciting, high-flying, hugely successful company until the day it wasn't. And we ended up shutting down uh, in this moment that um, we felt like we could have done more and we we ran out of runway, we ran out of money, and um, which is a very dissatisfying way of shutting down, right? If like, if you know that what you're making is terrible, then it's like, ah, it didn't work. Yeah. And that wasn't this. So, so we ran out of money, we shut the company down, and I had this I had this huge like crisis of confidence where I was like, who am I and what do I bring to the table? I mean, I had been a math and theater major who worked in opera and then got a business degree, spent a hot second in management consulting and then started a fashion company that failed. And I literally (laughs) was like, who, who was going to look twice at my resume? And more importantly, like, who should I be sending my resume to? I don't know who I am or what I want next. And I think it was that sort of extreme crisis uh, of, of identity and of confidence that forced me to reach out to literally everyone in my network and say, can we grab some coffee? Also, you have to pay for it because I'm broke. Like my company <laughs> failed and I have no money. Um, and so I did 70 of these coffee chats, seven zero. That's far more than anyone needs to do. Uh, but I'm always a little bit extra. And so I did 70 of these in 30 days and was able to get a lot of really helpful data to help me redirect and sort of put some structure around who I was, what I wanted next, and how to go about that search. What what did like you learn about yourself after that? <laughs> I'm like loving I mean, this story. I'm like, what, <laughs> what happened? Who hired you? <laughs> One of the biggest things I learned, uh, I was happiest when I was in charge of my calendar. And you're like, well, who's not in charge of your calendar? I'll tell you who's not, people who work in client services. You're not an ever in charge of your calendar. You jump when the client says jump. And I hated that. So I am multidisciplinary. I always have 50 side projects and I can make that work as long as I'm in charge of my calendar. So I was like, okay, do not go back to client services. That's an easy one. Um, I also discovered I'm really good at the zero to two stages of company building. Maybe two to 10. Okay. 10 to a hundred, like eh, not so much. Going from nothing to something is my favorite. And for a lot of people, that's terrifying, but I love it. And so I was like, okay, I need to stay in early stage startups. That also really suits me because I have so many different skills that in the earlier stages of companies, you love these like weird, strangely shaped puzzle pieces. You're like, okay, you can do this and that. That would never make it into a job description in an established company, right? but early on, you're like, I'll take it. So I was like, okay, I know what stage I fit at. I know I want to stay in the startup world. And then they came back to me and said, like, you're really good at storytelling. You're really good at communicating. You're really great at being on stage in front of an audience. So what does that mean? It means I go into marketing and communications. I go and think about content. I write books. Like, where does that sort of skill become really valuable? And so in this one moment, I went out and found a company based in Boston looking to expand into New York City, which is where I lived at the time, um, looking for, uh, you know, an executive to lead the New York expansion. And they needed someone to help run marketing. And I was like, I got you. These are my skills. I'm sure it was also very impressive for them to hear, and maybe you shared this, maybe you didn't, like, hey, I had 70 coffee chats with people. I know who I am. I know what my specialties are. And guess what? I can back this up because how many other people have you interviewed Mm -hmm. who have actually done this, right? I've always felt like informational interviews and these coffee chats, people don't understand. Like sometimes they're embarrassed to talk about them in an interview. I'm like, you should 
tell people how much you wanted this or how hard you've worked to get mm -hmm. this because they want to know that they're hiring the person who knows that they fit here and knows this is the right fit. They don't really want to take chances on someone who's like, well, I'm just testing this out. And if it doesn't work, I'm happy to jump ship. Like they're not interested. Exactly. Right? No, for sure. And I definitely shared that because part of why they wanted me was that I had failed at a startup, <laughs> that I knew this world so well. And um, and I was like, look, as part of my recovery from that failure, this is what I've learned, which also makes it really easy when people start asking for references. I know exactly who to send them to because I just talked to 70 of the people that I might consider for a reference. And I know who is going to tell the story that backs up what I want to get across to this team. Yeah. So building a portfolio career, tell me how this works with the whole idea of future proofing your career. This is a concept I think people hear a lot about and mm -hmm. they get a little nervous because <laughs> AI and everything else is going to take our jobs. And they're like, how can I future proof, proof my career? So tell yes. us, how do we do that? <laughs> yes. So this is where you sort of take this idea of a portfolio career and I expand it to a portfolio life. Because I think in many cases, there are elements of who you are, what you spend your time on, the relationships that you're building, the networks that you're cultivating, that you're not monetizing today. You might consider it a hobby or a community that you're paying into, or you know maybe your religious faith that you are you know a really important part of. That if you recognize that they are part of who you are and your bigger picture. When you get to a moment where you might need to make a pivot, you, you take them into consideration. You think about how that you might leverage them. And so you might have one job, one day job. That's your career today. And that's all maybe you've ever done. But you get to a point where you're seeing layoffs or major shifts in your industry. Generative AI is going to change how a lot of white collar work gets done. Maybe you say, you know what, this was a really good chapter and I am happy to come to the end of this chapter and I'm looking for something else. If you start from like, well, what do I do next? You're going to feel like you're going back to the beginning. But if you look around and say, hey, actually, I've been sitting on this nonprofit board for like five years and I took on this chair role of a committee running, you know, the audits or being in charge of development that's a skill I could bring to bear. Also, I also have five years of a track record with every other person on this board who would speak for me and who would be willing to make introductions for me based off of the work they've seen me do. So you start talking there. Then you look at like, what are the other hobbies you had? Maybe you have always done this thing like decorating cakes for your friends' kids' birthdays because you're amazing at it. And you're like, okay, but should I monetize that? Does that become a small business that maybe it is not your next big career move, but maybe it's a source of income in the short term that buys you the time to think about what the next career move is, right? So, so all of this is about like, how do I meet my needs? How do I figure out and build the relationships and the narrative and the path of where I go next? And how do I think about all of this as a fluid ever-changing mix that that I always have permission to change yeah. you're not a flake for changing this is the yeah. like most important thing I think especially for women who reach as I did a point in my career in my life where I needed a dramatic shift of my priorities when I had kids I needed a very different mix for this stage of life and I don't I don't apologize for that I love that. This is fantastic. Well, Christina, tell everyone where they can learn more about you, follow you, buy your book, um, all the things. Sure. So PortfolioLife.com has links to every major retailer, every place you might want to buy your book from. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's where I hang out these days. I feel like the nerds won the social media <laughs> challenge. Uh, and um, you can sign up for my newsletter uh, through ChristinaWallace.com. I publish like twice a year, so don't get too excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, for someone that might be very exciting, they're like, great. I don't know. That's amazing. Well, Christina, thank you so much for joining us today. And we'll be sure to link all of that in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me.